My name is Erica Quach, and I am a program officer at the National Committee on U.S.-China Relations. Joining me today is Wen Chi Yu, research fellow at the Harvard Kennedy School Ash Center for Democratic Governance and Innovation, where she conducts research on technology, education, and cross-border social impact. The topic of today's interview is China's crackdown on after-school tutoring and its implications. Wen Chi, thank you so much for speaking with me today. Yeah, thanks for having me. Let's start with a general overview of what has happened with China's crackdown on the K to 12 after-school tutoring sector. Can you give us an introduction to this newly implemented policy? Yeah, absolutely. So, what is happening to this 100 billion after-school tutoring market in China,、um, and why do we need to care about it? How is it relevant to us here in the United States or in other parts of the world?、Um, So on July 24th,、uh, the Chinese government basically issued the so-called double reduction policy,、uh, and the literate、um, uh, translation uh, of this regulation is the opinion to reduce compulsory student homework burden and to reduce after-school tutoring burden. So the two burdens are the so-called double reduction,、um, and then the market immediately felt the impact. Uh, what we've seen is that stocks of several publicly listed education companies plunged and have not recovered since.、Um, and the the opinion is viewed as really one of the most drastic measures in recent years because of its impact on all students, schools, teachers, parents, and education businesses. Um, basically, the education technology business、uh, recently has become a sector that's experienced rapid growth in recent years.、Um, unlike education in the United States,、um, education、um, is really centralized in China, from curriculum design, pedagogy, to、uh, school administration, to the hiring and retention and training of teachers. Everything is pretty much done、uh, and controlled by the government. So. The recent rise of after-school tutoring, especially those you know education businesses who've been enabled by technology, and up until、um, the recent regulations,、um, really grew rapidly、uh, due to capital injection.、Um, that's why I said you know one hundred billion dollar after-school tutoring market,、um, and you know they grew especially during the pandemic、uh, when schools were closed. And、um, the government views this、um, after-school tutoring sector as sort of a disruption、uh, to public school education、uh, in a way that you know the government and society find troubling.、Um, and I, I would really prefer to say the government is primarily targeting the K to 12 cram school industry. Uh, rather, rather than sort of the entire private tutoring、uh, sector,、um, you can see, you know, a lot of a lot of sort of the、uh, the regulations and and notices are focused on sort of test based and school curriculum based、uh, after school tutoring businesses. So yeah, so that's essentially what happened recently.、Yeah. Um, did this policy come out of the blue, or is it? Was it something that was expected? Were there rumors circulating about it before it actually was implemented? Yeah, so、um, I would say it, it's not completely unexpected, especially if you follow education market in China. So there have been, you know, signs earlier this year.、Um, I would say right around, right after the Chinese New Year,、um, people started hearing rumors on social media platforms and seeing the news that you know some kind of new education regulations are coming. Um, but no one really knew the extent and the scale of it until、um, I would say, really, you know, in in July. Even though I would say, leading up to July,、um, what we've seen is that a lot of news coverage, you know, of what may happen.、Um, so、um, it's it's not entirely unexpected.、Um, I, I would say so. Thanks for that context.、Um, it would. It would be great to get some context on how after-school tutoring has become so prominent in China.、Um, can you briefly walk us through the timeline and evolution of China's education system? What led to this rapid growth of China's after-school tutoring market? 
Yeah, absolutely. I, I think, you know, um, to understand sort of the, the after school tutoring and why it's such a big deal in China, um, one needs to understand just the education system in China. Um, I think, first of all, as I said, you know, education in China is really viewed as sort of public service and should be provided by the state, the government. Um, and the state, uh, the government considers that taking care of a student um, education is the, is the government and the state's responsibility, not the private sectors. And schools are supposed to even be like a childcare center. So in, in this regulation, what you will find is that um, it really emphasizes the role of school in taking care of children, even after school hours. And so that's quite different from, I would say, the education system here in the United States. And then second, um, what's leading up to this huge after school tutoring sector is that you really have a test-based educational system in China. Um, by the way, it's not just in China, in mainland China, it's actually pretty prevalent throughout East Asia. So this test-based educational system basically ranks student performance, um, you know, from elementary school all the way to college. And your academic performance pretty much determines your future and your the kind of job you will get, um, much more so than here in the U.S. So, for example, a college entrance exam. A lot of people will say that's probably the most important exam one can have in, in his or her life. You spend two to three days uh, going through the exams, and then it determines what school you're going to and, um, you know, what school what college you go to pretty much determines what jobs you're going to get. And of course, what jobs you're going to get determines sort of your future, your uh, ability to earn an income or so. So, you know, it, it's so important to understand that it's just a very intensely focused on tests. Um, that's why after school tutoring flourishes in those societies, um, as I said, not just limited to China, um, because parents want their kids to do well in taking tests. It's also called shadow education uh, sector. It's been around for a long time. And really during the pandemic, as I said, due to school closures and because of technology. So it really enables more students and more businesses to think about how to continue um, education in a way that's undisrupted. And that's why that led to this tremendous market of education technology just over the last two years. That's kind of a, a, the, a quick history of what's going on. And I can even give some numbers, um, you know, just during the pandemic 2020, uh, it's estimated that more than $10 billion just in one year were sort of poured into the private tutoring uh, sector. In terms of you know how much every family is spending on tutoring, just to put in perspective, it's about 50% of all educational expenses in China's first tier cities. And that's tremendous burden, uh, financial burden on you know most families. So what you're seeing is that there's a lot of sort of social anxiety among parents because they're all worried about their kids not being competitive enough. And of course, that's also tremendous pressure on students and, and, and children as they all need to compete to do well and test well. And so on top of that, I think there's a lot of other anxiety in society, um, which you know we can even touch on later. Um, that's sort of contributed to this government decision that, okay, it's time to really crack down on this private after-school tutoring sector, which in their mind, again, is only adding uh, stress, pressure to student life. Thank you. That really sets the stage um, for us to understand why it became such a booming sector in China, tutoring that is. Similarly, my next question is about the factors and the reasons that contribute to the, the crackdown. So I read around that, you know, the demographic crisis, the tech crackdown, and she's um, further focus on common prosperity are, you know, some factors that may be contributing to this crackdown. 
can you unpack some of these and um, let us know what your opinions are on which drivers are contributing more to the crackdown um, than others? Yeah, I think, you know, for us sort of in the West, it's very easy to read news headlines and every day, almost every day now, there's some kind of crackdown um, by the Chinese government on certain parts of the economy um, and education is one of them. Um, but I would say, you know, let's sort of, you know, step back and really look at where China's economic and social, um, I would say, um, state is today. Um, so a lot of the recent regulatory crackdown or reforms, um, however you call it, um, is really targeting to use the government, the Chinese government's language is targeting sort of the new uh, wealth creation sector. So whether it's technology, I think everyone is seeing that um, and it's fintech, right? Um, that we saw what and financial uh, went through. We're seeing that in real estate, uh, we're seeing that um, potentially in health, um, you know, there's a rumor that it's coming. And, um, you know, obviously the, the internet sector in general, online gaming, video gaming, we also saw that just two days ago. Um, it's very much aligned with the government's or President Xi's sort of common prosperity focus because he and I'm sure his government think that since I would say the, you know, open and reform era in the late 70s, um, you know, Chinese, uh, Chinese society has grown to be so unequal. And so the wealth distribution is uh, un uneven. I think that, um, and on top of that, sort of watching um, what's going on in the West, um, in a Western sort of society. In particular, I would say sort of the inequality, the growing uh, divide in society, and a lot of it, again, you know, in, enabled by the tech sector, the social media platform, et cetera. I think they kind of look at everything and they feel like, okay, this cannot happen in China. They don't want to see that happening in China. So, um, so it, you know, I would say it's hard to just look at education sector as one thing. You really have to look at everything that's hoping, uh, that's happening in China right now. Um, and I think, you know, there's sort of a lot of domestic concerns that I just touched on. Um, there's also some national security um, concern in a lot of those policy changes. China saw what happened in Hong Kong, the elections in Western societies, again, you know, a lot of like misinformation on the internet. Um, and so I think the Chinese leadership feels, again, feels like, okay, you know, it's too risky for uh, their own young people, their young minds to, you know, be heavily influenced by these things they probably consider sort of, you know, um, more sort of not the right kind of things they want um, their students to have. So what you're seeing is also sort of school curriculum is reintroducing sort of socialist thinking um, and they want to teach, you know, Xi Jinping thoughts in, in school curriculum. And um, they want, you know, young minds to learn more about Chinese traditions, you know, cultural heritage. Um, a lot of it is, again, like sort of coming back to the Chinese cores, um, you know, that's sort of the way I, I put it, um, to make sure that, you know, China is in some way um, insulated from a lot of what's going on uh, in other parts of the world. Um, so, you know, I, I think if, you, if you're in the Chinese leadership sort of shoes, you can see why they're doing it. Um, whether you agree or, you know, if these measures um, are really going to lead to the kind of outcomes uh, they want to see in society, I think is up to debate. Yeah, thank you for that. And on the topic of demographics and the demographic crisis, is this connected to encouraging families to have a third child? You mean the education policy, is that yeah. right? Yeah, there's definitely, I mean, there's definitely a connection there, right? Like I said, you know, if, you know, the average family, especially those in the tier 
one, two, three cities, um, if they feel this uh, anxiety around um, paying so much for tutoring classes for their kids, um, parents may not feel like they can afford having more kids. When uh, China finally started loosening up their sort of one child and then two child and now three child policy, um, but you know, how many families are really having second or third child and do they feel like they can afford it, right? You know, there's again, like living expenses in those um, tier one, two, three cities um, have become so uh, burdensome on a lot of the sort of middle income families. So I think, you know, definitely there's a, an intent to make sure that this is not an extra kind of burden on the middle class family and the lower, I would say, income families. Switching gears just a little bit, um, with this new policy in place, what does the future of K-12 tutoring look like? Um, will tutoring now disappear completely or will it take a different form? Are private education companies pivoting their offerings? If so, how? Yeah, I mean, I think it's hard to say. Um, immediately, we're seeing the impact uh, that a lot of those uh, after school tutoring companies have closed. Um, and the regulations also stipulated that local authorities will be the ones to carry out those uh, regulations. And, you know, each locality uh, has kind of its own uh, more detailed uh, implementation details too. So um, a lot of businesses are, have closed doors, especially those school curriculum based, as I said, you know, prime school kind of uh, tutoring businesses. And there's still a lot of, you know, other kinds of businesses that are trying to seeking clarification, I would say. You certainly see the immediate impact. Um, but in terms of long term, it's really hard to say because people do question, and, and myself too, this kind of dramatic crackdown, is it really going to address the demand issue? The reason why uh, it's become such a huge industry and big business is because there's tremendous demand out there. Um, and so you know, if you don't address the root cause, again, in my view, it's really this sort of test-based educational culture and this Gaokao system, right? The college entrance exam system. Everything goes back to the Gaokao system. So if you don't address the elephant in the room by simply closing down the businesses, the demand is still there. So the question is, where do people go? You know, and and... I've seen sort of discussions on the social media, people started to say, okay, the wealthiest will always find a way because they can even, they can have the private tutors to come to their home. They don't need to send their kids to those businesses. Um, but what about the majority of the people? You know, what do they do? Um, what's interesting is people, you know, keep referring back to sort of the South Korea example. Uh, so South Korea in, in the 80s also went through that drastic change and, you know, banning of those cram schools. Um, and it just went underground. And later on, they had to legalize it. Um, and now South Korea is still, I think the student uh, tutoring sort of penetration rate uh, is the highest in the world. So, you know, I do have question about whether those policies are eventually going to address the demand issue. Um, but I guess the government probably thinks that if you nip the, those businesses in the bud, it, you can at least curtail uh, some of the sort of demand. We'll see. No, we'll see. Um, you talked about this a little bit in your previous answer, but um, how is the general public in China responding to these regulations? I'm sure there are some who feel relieved by the policy and are in support of it, but others who feel additional pressure from it. Um, can you break this down for us? Why are some supportive and others against this policy? Yeah, like I said, you know, parents fall on different sides of the argument. Some agree that it is, you know, really time to lessen the pressure on students um, and, and work towards more of a sort of equitable access um, and just less 
pressure on both parents and students. Um, and then you have others who really think this will just increase inequities because you know, only the wealthiest will be able to find workarounds uh, to the crackdown on access to tutoring. Um, I see definitely a lot of discussions on social media. Um, you know, a lot of people support those policies. Um, a lot of people don't. Again, I do think people will find their own ways. I've heard that people will just find different ways to find tutoring um, because no one wants their kids to be lagging behind when it comes to this Dow Cow system. Yeah, I, but you know, I, the other thing, um, other than sort of society um, reaction, the other thing in this document that's really interesting is also to really focus on enhancing the quality of uh, school education as well as uh, teacher qualification. So I think that's really the intent um, for the government, which is rightly so. Um, there's a reason why you know people seek outside of school kind of tutoring rather than focusing on their in-school um, education, right? Uh, that that shouldn't be the case. And so the government is now saying, no, 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 let's just make sure everything comes back to the school. So, you know, let's focus on enhancing uh, and delivering higher quality education. And um, if there is a need, and it is even written in the document that um, for after school tutoring, that can take place in school. So teachers can play the role of tutors and schools can even pay extra pay to the teachers. Uh, they just don't want um, the private businesses to play the tutoring role. And so what about those people who have lost their jobs as a result of this? Not just the private tutors, but also software engineers, um, the admins and managers of yeah. these private education companies. Yeah, it's really interesting. Um, so just to put in perspective sort of how many people um, are losing and have lost the jobs. Um, so uh, I, I've seen a report basically calculating just among some of the tech giants, uh, the companies, about 50,000 jobs have been lost uh, since the announcement of the regulation in, in late July. Um, but, you know, my own estimate is about 100,000 at least that have been lost um, if you calculate the entire sector. Um, and in the Beijing government's implementation document, it also addresses sort of the unemployment issue. So um, the government, the Beijing government basically says they will host online job fairs. Uh, specifically catering to the tutoring sector employees. They estimate about 90,000 jobs are at risk from sort of product development, sales, technology support to finance, et cetera. I mean, that's not a small number, but I think, you know, the government is determined and really thinks this kind of unemployment, they probably think it's healthy um, for society since they really don't think this sector should exist um, at all. So yeah, so um, I, you know, we've seen reports of sort of young people, especially those who um, can make a pretty good salary um, doing tutoring in the tutoring business um, is really let down because, you know, now they have to you know, figure out what else they can do and if they can, you know, earn as much money um, like before in the private sector, uh, in the private tutor sector. Right. What, what does it look like for educators in the future? And within this question, can you talk a little bit about why public school teachers were so heavily involved in private tutoring? Yeah, I think, um, I really think one of the main things is the pay. Public education and public school pay is just not as lucrative. And if you could have the additional income by taking on outside tutoring opportunities, of course, you know, school teachers are gonna do it. And of course, you know, government really thinks this is wrong. And that's one of the main reasons they wanna crack down because what's happening is that you have school teachers who don't even focus on um, 
teaching in school anymore. So, you know, they would work with outside tutoring companies, businesses, and even parents to say, okay, if you need more, you know, come to my private business, tutoring business, right? This really should not um, happen um, in, 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 in education, sort of uh, in the education sector. So um, I, I think that's one of the reasons, again, you know, the government wants to crack down and the government has said, you know, schools can pay um, additional, um, you know, money to teachers who are willing to do tutoring in school. Um, so again, it's sort of coming back to everything can happen inside a school, just not um, by those private businesses. Um, and you mentioned this before, but it's tutoring, this out of school tutoring, cram school industry, it's not limited to China. You mentioned that other East Asian regions like South Korea in particular, but also Japan, Taiwan, and Singapore have these have had these thriving cram school industries. Um, they've also experienced crackdowns in those places as well. Are there any lessons for China in the experiences of these other places? Yeah, like I said, this shadow education industry um, has long existed in many of the other East Asian societies, right? You find it in Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, Hong Kong, Singapore, you know, mainland China. Um, and, you know, all these societies shares one, um, one thing, which is college entrance exams pretty much determine, um, you know, your, your job prospect. And that's why it matters so much for kids to do well um, in, from elementary school all the way leading up to uh, the college entrance exam. Um, so fundamentally, you know, I do think to reform the college entrance exam as sort of the one single criteria is really important uh, if you wanna change this after school tutoring uh, tradition and culture. I think if there's any lessons learned is that simply banning it is not going to address the problem as we've seen in, in South Korea. Um, and so, you know, what else can we do and what does this mean? Um, I, I think I am, you know, very curious to see um, in the next year or so, um, what would uh, education look like, especially private education? But coming back to sort of why we're having this conversation and why does it matter, I think one has to look at sort of the, the current state of social and economic development in China right now. I think um, China is going through a lot of changes. I mean, it's always going through a lot of changes, but right now is kind of turning inward. And my question to China is sort of, okay, China in the last, you know, three to four decades has really benefited hugely from more and more global minded citizens, right? Many of the Chinese students study abroad, uh, work abroad, and then they bring the skills and knowledge back to China. And they've created this like vibrant and, you know, extremely innovative economy over the last few years. Um, so is it wise to kind of reverse the trend and is it even feasible? Um, you know, I, 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 I don't know. I, I think um, it just remains questionable, in particular as it relates to sort of the prohibition of having foreign teachers uh, to teach Chinese students um, and not allowing foreign curriculum to be taught uh, in schools. A lot of it seems to be sort of you know, making sure the Chinese students are not too heavily influenced by the West um, or international community. Um, so that's the biggest question I have. Um, not so much with regards to the cram school culture. I think, you know, to a large extent, I think a lot of people would agree it's it's become so burdensome and unhealthy for any sort of young student um, development. Um, but, you know, sort of cutting off this connection to international uh, learning uh, and exposure, I think that that is a big question because I do think China is where it is today. 
uh, is because of the international exchanges and understanding, you know, that a lot of the companies have been able to bridge um, organizations have been able to facilitate um, in terms of the connections. Thank you so much. And um, yeah, lots of questions to ponder. But thank you so much. I think that's all the time that we have for today for this interview. Um, so thank you, Wenqi, for sharing your thoughts and for speaking with me today. We hope that those who have tuned in found the interview interesting and informative. We hope that you will join um, future National Committee programming and interviews. So thank you, everyone. Take care and have a nice day. Thank you.